So, on this last Sunday before the 2020 election, in this time of pandemic and political anxiety, in this time of economic uncertainty and existential threats on a global scale, I want to spend a little time with you thinking about and talking about democracy. Many have done this before me, of course, and uh, I'm thinking of H.L. Mencken, who wrote, as democracy has perfected, the office of president re represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. And on some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire, and at last, the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. I think of Winston Churchill saying, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. It was Churchill who also said the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. I think of Charles Bukowski who wrote, the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship is that in a democracy you vote first and take orders later. In a dictatorship, you don't have to waste your time voting. I think about Louis Brandeis, who said, we can have democracy in this country, or we can have great wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we cannot have both. And I think about Reinhold Niebuhr, who wrote, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, man's inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Democracy, of course, is a astonishingly complex construction with endless variations and competing ideas and vulnerabilities that are simply unavoidable. And I want to emphasize that point. The vulnerabilities to democracy, especially liberal democracy, are unavoidable. They cannot be designed out without compromising the very same freedoms that democracy supposedly protects. And that's because of the inherent tensions that democracy tries to balance, like between freedom and responsibility, between individualism and a collective identity, between those who have power and those who do not, between the majority and the minority of any, at any given moment in time, between the stability of tradition and the flexibility for adaptation. And because of all these, democracy simply has to be a moving sea rather than a frozen pond. You probably know that what we claim in the United States is only one variation on democracy and that ours is technically both a democracy and a republic. You probably know it differs from di direct democracy as envisioned by the ancient Greeks and as sort of still practiced in Switzerland. It differs from parliamentary democracy like they have in Israel, South Africa, and in England, and from unitary republic systems like they have in places like France and Germany and different still from the melding of democratic republic and constitutional monarchy like they have in Norway, Sweden, and in Japan. And I share all that just to make really clear that the United States does not have a corner on the market of democracy, not even a little bit. In fact, our constitution, being one of the oldest, is also one of the most archaic in terms of having been conceived without the benefit of more modern thinking on the subject. And as many people have observed, rightly observed, it was written exclusively by and for wealthy male white slave owners. It is worth it, I think, to spend a little time on how democracies are defined. One of the most often quoted and referenced works on the subject is Professor Larry Diamond of Stanford. He said a democracy needs to have four key elements. First, a system for choosing and replacing the government through free and fair elections. Two, 
active participation of citizens in both politics and civic life. Three, protection of the human rights of all citizens. And four, a rule of law in which all laws and procedures are applied equally to all citizens. You do not need to be a scholar or a professor or even especially aware to see that by those criteria, the United States has never actually had a democracy. By those criteria, the United States has never actually had a democracy, and I mean not ever, not even for a second. We've never had free and fair elections. We've never allowed all citizens to participate in civic life. We've never protected everyone's human rights, and we have never applied the law equally to all citizens. Plainly spoken, if democracy is the goal and those are the criteria, we got a long ways to go. And the last four years, quite honestly, have been a regression rather than progress. President Roosevelt in 1941 laid out what he believed were the four freedoms of democracy that should inform all democratic policy making. And those were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Wonderful, succinct, aspirational, but not accomplished. Not by far. Who among us is not terrified of poverty in America? Who isn't afraid of being hungry and having no food, nothing to eat? Who isn't afraid of being cold and having no place to go? I am. And I'm afraid of those things for you, for my family, for myself. These are righteous fears. Because this democracy offers next to nothing in terms of protection, structurally or culturally, especially if you happen to be a person of color, a descendant of enslaved people, a felon, a woman, someone seeking asylum, someone who is uneducated, differently abled, or poor. One of the key vulnerabilities of democracy especially here in the United States, is the entanglement and the corruption of money. I've said this before, I will probably say it again. The American form of democracy is enmeshed with the American form of capitalism, and the American form of capitalism is merciless. Merciless born of slavery and child labor and indentured servitude and debtors' prisons, cruel, deadly, brown children in cages, whole communities disenfranchised, generations locked in poverty, leaving people literally bleeding and dying in the street. Merciless. In America, it's the proverbial golden rule, right? If you got the gold, you make the rules. If you don't got the gold, God help you. Because this capitalist democracy will barely lift a finger to make things fair. The great black American poet Langston Hughes famously wrote, America was never America for me. James Bovard once wrote, once observed, Democracy has to be more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. And I don't know, but I suspect the two wolves in that allegory are the Democratic and the Republican parties and the sheep are, is we the people, you and I, or at least we the people who don't happen to be wealthy. I think we should be explicit about the anxiety many of us are feeling right now regarding what passes for or what's left of 
democracy in America. In their book, How Democracies Die, which by the way was not written about our current president, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt outline four indicators of author authoritarian behavior. First, rejection of or a very weak commitment to the rules and norms of the democratic process. Second, denying the legitimacy of political rivals, referring to them as criminals or foreign agents, pretending that alternate views are existential threats to the country. Third, encouragement or condoning of violence, having associations with paramilitary armed gangs or other groups that encourage or condone violence. And fourth, a willingness to curtail the civil liberties of opponents and including the media. All of which should sound frighteningly familiar and lead to the unfortunate conclusion that some 40% of the current electorate in America is at least somewhat in favor of authoritarianism, which is a real problem for those of us who believe in democracy and want to support democratic principles like fair elections and freedom from want and fear and equal treatment of all citizens under common law. If Harold Laswell is right, he was later echoed by Martin Luther King Jr. And if politics is the art of determining who gets what and when, when it comes to education, opportunity, health care, and justice, then we who believe in the freedoms of democracy have no business sitting on any political sidelines. Lives are at stake. I'm going to end with one last observation. I've been talking about civic and civil engagement and philosophy and criteria for democracies and so on. But I believe that before civic engagement, we all need some spiritual fortitude. I've been thinking about Howard Thurman and about Jesus. And I, I love this quote about Jesus, Howard Thurman wrote, his message focused on the urgency of a radical change in the inner life of, an ind of the people. He recognized that out of the heart are the issues of life and that no external force, no matter how great and overwhelming, can at long last destroy a people if it does not first win the victory of the spirit against them. Because friends, this is how authoritarianism will win, by defeating our spirit, by wearing us down, by making us feel helpless or hopeless, by convincing us that there's nothing we can do, which is bullpucky. We can vote. We can organize. We can demonstrate what justice looks like and what civility looks like and what love looks like. We can remind followers of certain Christian leaders of what Christ actually said and actually stood for. We can remind ourselves what Christ actually said and stood for. We can imagine that a different world is possible. Artist Michael Fronty wrote, If you think you need love right now, the truth is right now love needs you. Love needs you to be your best, your brightest, your loudest, your most colorful. Don't let this election get you down, dehumanize you, or deter you from connecting with others. You are not a poll sample. You are not a statistic. You are not a number. Don't let them make you feel cold, calloused, or confused, you are a human being. 
and your voice deserves to be heard in the streets, in your home, in your communities, online, and at the ballot box. So keep your head up. Don't give up on equality. Don't give up on justice. Don't give up on the power and the beauty of diversity. Don't give up on helping to relieve the suffering of others. Don't give up on an end to wars or bringing prosperity to communities everywhere. Don't give up on our children. Don't give up on our family. Most of all, don't give up on love because it is love that has inspired all that is good in the world. Just like water finds its way through any crack and crevice to where it's destined to go, love also finds a way. And right now, love needs you to help it find its way into our living rooms, our dinner tables, our schools, our hospitals, our workplaces, our homeless lines, and even into our elections. We need imagination to help fuel ideas for a better world. We need tenacity to get us through our darkest times. We need love to remind us that we are at our most powerful when we work together to help everyone rise up. This is my wish for all of us, for our country, even for supporters of our current president. Don't give up on equality. Don't give up on justice. Don't give up on the power and the beauty of diversity. Imagine that a better world is possible. And every day, create just a little more space for that world. Amen.